I was born in South Africa and lived about three, four hours from the closest ocean. When I was 13, my parents took me on holiday to a seaside resort. 13 is an awkward age. Um, I didn't know what to do, you know, I was too old to build sandcastles. I didn't really want to play in the surf, um, but I really couldn't look after myself and amuse myself. So what I did was look at the bigger guys and saw what they were doing, and they were surfing. And man, I wanted to surf. Two days before the end of the holiday, I found somebody who had a sign up that said, um, boards for rent. And I ran up to my parents and I said, hey, can I have some money? I want to go rent a board. And they said, Mark, yeah, sure. Um, you can swim. Nothing can happen to you. Go ahead, go and rent a board. And so I went to the guy and I said, I want the board. He barely looked at me, gave it to me. You know, there were some girls walking around. He was much more interested in them. And I took this board and I looked out to the ocean and saw the waves, and I saw the big waves where the guys were really doing the fun stuff. And I aimed the board there, climbed on it, and started paddling out. Now, there was a problem. Um, it was a lot harder than I thought. And I, to get to the, where the waves were, where the people were catching them, you had to go past the wave, part where the waves were breaking. And no matter what I tried, I tried to go over the waves, under the waves. Every time I tried this, I'd get thrown around, pushed underwater, half drowned, and I barely knew where I was, except the board was buoyant. So it would go up and pull me up, and I'd swim and come back out again, try and get a little further. About after 10, 15 times of doing this, I think the level of the Indian Ocean had dropped by this much. Um, my lungs were full of water, and I was nearly drowning, and I decided this is it. I turned my board around and started heading back to the beach. And of course, the waves weren't playing fair. They immediately caught me, threw me down again. But something was different. And I tried to get up to get a, some air, and I realized I was still on the board. I'd actually caught a wave, uh, <laughs> totally by accident. Now, I'm not going to lie to you and say I stood up and went surfing in. No, I held on to my board, held on really tight, got all the way in where I could climb off the board, and uh, my legs were shaking. I got off, took the board to the guy, uh, he gave it back to him, and he said, you know, you should have listened to me. I was about to call the lifeguards, and I told you, go down there, the waves are smaller, that's where you learn to surf. And even the good guys go out there, you go out there, and then you swim behind the waves, and you go to where the big waves are, only when you're good. Well, I immediately thought, okay, tomorrow I'll be good, I'll get aboard, I'll go out and do that. But of course, tomorrow never came, because it rained, and then we had to go home. So it took about 15 years before I got another chance to teach myself how to surf. And this time it was a completely different wave. It was a fluorescent wave, and it came in the form of this guy, Doug Prasher, who gave a talk right here at Connecticut College about his research. And his research is about this jellyfish. Jellyfish is a crystal jellyfish, Cora Victoria. It has about 300, 350 photo organs on the umbrella of the crystal jellyfish, they give off green light. Um, there's a protein that's responsible for this green light called green fluorescent protein. Now, proteins are incredibly small. You can't see them. But they're incredibly important because they do all the chemistry in your body, in every organism's body. We want to know when they're made, where they go to, and so on. Now, we all know that there's DNA in every single cell, and the DNA is a bit like a recipe book. And for every protein, there's a gene or a recipe that basically says, hey, cell, this is how you're going to make this protein. And if a cell wants to make the protein, it goes to the beginning of the gene, and it reads the instructions. And at the end, there's something called a stop codon, which basically says, stop, you're done. You know, don't carry on. So Doug had this crazy idea. Let's go to the jellyfish and find the gene for green fluorescent protein. So the recipe how to make this fluorescent protein, take it from the jellyfish, copy it a million times, and then when you have a protein and you want to see when that protein's made, and if you know where its gene is, what you do is you go to your DNA, you've got your gene for your protein, at the end there's a stop codon, 
but you sneak the gene for the green fluorescent protein in there before the stop codon. So when the cell wants to make it, it starts at the top, it makes the protein, that's the protein there, and then it hangs green fluorescent protein at the end of it. If you shine a blue light on it, it'll glow green. So you'll see when your protein's made, and you'll see where it's going. So that was Doug's idea. This was in the early 90s. I was a young, untenured professor here. And the 13-year-old frustrated surfer in me said, hey, Mark, that's a cool project. You should do this. Um, the untenured professor said, yeah, I know nothing about glowing proteins. I know nothing about photophysics. I don't even know anything about proteins. Um, but it is a cool project. I mean, think about it. Jellyfish, glowing, medicine. Yeah, these are all cool things. And somehow the 13-year-old in me won, and I caught this wave. Now, Doug Pressure started this. He had this idea originally. At this time, there weren't many people doing this research. So I took this risk, I tried the research with my students, but because many, there weren't many people who were interested in, I could fail a few times, and I did. I mean, I got thrown around, but I'd learned something. I'd learned that I should listen to people and ask some people, get on the shoulders of giants. And so I asked Doug, you know, what should I do? How should I do this? And so I knew that I shouldn't go swim straight out. I went and took the easy route to go. And it worked pretty well. But things have changed. When Doug Pressure came and gave this talk at Connecticut College, um, there were about five, six people working in the field. Now, there are about 20,000 papers that are published every year that use green fluorescent proteins. It's very hard to find yourself a space to surf on these waves now. Um, Especially, you know, you'd think you've just got a wave and somebody comes with a brand new board and comes sneaking right in front of you and steals your work. Well, not really, but they do it better and quicker than you can. Especially since we've just got undergraduates here. And so it makes life a little bit harder. So we've got to be a little careful. Also, what's really interesting is the majority of the people that surf the fluorescent wave have actually learned how to surf. You know, they haven't gone out there and had fun and got dunked a couple of times and drunk some seawater. They actually went to surfing classes. And you can see it. They're technically brilliant. Um, but they're also fussy. They'll only take the nicest waves. And they leave perfectly useful waves behind for us with, and students to take. And so I take my students. Typically, I like to take them out there without much training. So they, they get thrown around in the waves a little bit and so that they learn um, you know, what it's like if things don't work and how to find their own way. But while we were there, we also looked to see what other people are doing. And just last year, Hina Chowdhury was out there, and she had this amazing move, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. She's a cardiologist, and she knew that pregnant women who have a heart attack are the most likely of any demographic to survive a heart attack. So what is it about pregnant women? Why would they survive a heart attack? And she had a theory. And the theory was this, that when pregnant women have a heart attack, the heart sends out a message. And it's, hey, I've had a heart attack. Help me. And in a pregnant woman, that message goes all the way down to the fetus. And some fetal stem cells will get sent up to the heart. And they will fix the heart. And of course, Nobody else has fetal stem cells in them except a pregnant woman, and that's the only reason. But now, how do you prove this? Well, now she had a beautiful experiment to prove this. What she did is she took a normal mouse that didn't have a single fluorescent cell in it, and she mated it with a green fluorescent mouse. So this mouse, every single cell is green fluorescent. The embryo, which you can see up here, was green fluorescent. And so she took the mother with the green fluorescent embryo, a mouse, and then induced a heart attack into this mouse, let the mother come to term, give birth to the green fluorescent baby, and then had a look afterwards at the heart. And lo and behold, in the heart, there were green fluorescent cells just where the heart attack had occurred, where the heart muscle cells had died. 
So the only way this could have come about was the green fluorescent cells come from the embryo, move through the umbilical cord, come to the heart, and fix the heart. She also did some control experiments. For example, she took a green a mouse with a green fluorescent embryo and didn't induce a heart attack and couldn't find any green fluorescent cells. So those are all the sort of cool experiments that you can see when you're surfing on the green fluorescent wave. Uh, they're fantastic ones. And my sort of conclusion to all of this is if you're looking to do something political, intellectual, physical, be adventurous, take a risk, catch the sort of unusual wave. Don't learn how to surf. Just go out there, get thrown around a couple of times. I think in today's society, with overprotective parents, with litigation, with teaching towards tests like GREs and MCATs and things like that, we are often a little too reserved. So I think, you know, go for it, be better, um, die living, as we saw on the Better Talk, and you can perhaps catch a bioluminescent wave like this. Unfortunately, that's not me. I haven't surfed on a real wave ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.